What do females want? The eternal question, of course. In this lecture, we're going to discuss what female preference is, and what are some models of female preference, and we're going to actually cover runaway sexual selection and relate that to linkage disequilibrium. We're going to compare sexual and natural selection and list some theories of female assessment. First up, let's start off with some trade-offs. So we did mention earlier that the sexual selection often comes at a counter to natural selection. So that can come in the form of selection trade-off. So these are some widow birds. Widow birds have these uh, incredibly long tails. And females prefer male widow birds that have a longer tail. What will happen is a male widow bird will be able to have more than two nests if it has a longer tail, but less than one, on average, one or zero nests if they have a short tail. Some research, some clever researchers cut widow birds' tails off and then took them apart and glued them back on so they could make either longer or shorter. And what they found is if they artificially lengthened the widow bird's tail, that the females would absolutely love that. So it's really just tail length that matters. However, long tails are, birds with long tails uh, are not as able to forage and thus they lose more body mass. So there is a bit of a natural selection versus sexual selection trade-off going on in widow birds. We also see this as uh, with frogs. And we see this in a couple ways with frogs, but let's, uh, oops, sorry. Let's uh, get the um, body mass in widow birds. We also see this in terms of predation. <clears throat> so long calls for frogs are more attractive, both to females and to bats. It's actually been shown that the bats are more able to detect a frog with a longer call, just like the FBI is more able to, to trace your call when, it's, when you stay on the line for a while. But females actually will pass up a short collar to get with a long collar. And this is actually kind of important for how much they'll do this. If a long call is quiet and the short call is loud, then the females will still prefer the long collar. If the long call is far away and the short call is real near, then the females will come to the one that is far away because they really do prefer that long call. Your book goes into a bit more detail about exactly how much longer the call has to be to elicit a difference in female response, but really it shows that the females like the longer calling males. And we're gonna circle back to this in a little while. All right, so what about female preference? So what do females prefer and how does it matter regarding, um, well, what type of males they actually are. And this is where I like to cover something called arbitrary traits. So the consequences of female selection are that certain male traits are going to be expressed at a higher level. One consequence is that arbitrary traits are going to be expressed at a higher level. Some of you may recognize uh, Justin Bieber right here. Uh, Justin Bieber was the absolute paragon of female sexual selection for a while. Why? It's a great question. <laughs> um, actually, when he started off his musical career with uh, One Less Lonely Girl, he still hadn't uh, fully developed his deep and beautiful voice. He had not developed secondary sexual characteristics like body hair or musculature. So he effectively looked like a young girl. So why did females like him so much? Good question. One reason was actually that other females liked them, and that if other females liked Justin Bieber, then it must make sense to like Justin Bieber. And we're going to get back to that with something called the sexy sons hypothesis. But arbitrary really does really means unrelated to natural selection. Here's another example of an arbitrary selection. If you raise birds with, uh, if you take these some birds and you attach fancy hats to them, then these little ornaments, the females that are raised by families where the male has a fancy hat are going to prefer males that have a fancy hat. This ornamentation isn't even part of the natural um, line of things, but females that are raised with a male that has a fancy hat are going to assume that fancy hats are a male thing and mean maleness, and they are going to prefer males with fancy hats. Whereas if the female has a fancy hat or neither adult has a fancy hat, the, fe the female bird really doesn't care about fancy hats or not. So this is one of those arbitrary things depending on how the bird was raised. We also have these uh, percent of female time spent with a near red versus a normal male. So they actually prefer to spend time with a male that was 
uh, that was enjoyed by more females. This is one of those interesting experiments to see if an arbitrary trait could be injected into a population, and the answer was yes. So there is female choice, and there can be evolution from this. A genetic preference of a male display leads to assortative mating. So think of it this way. The genetic preference and a genetic display, obviously a fancy hat isn't a genetic display, but a genetic preference for a certain trait and the trait itself are both under selection and will assortatively mate. So you will end up having what's called an, e an equilibrium here. I see equilibrium a lot. This equilibrium occurs when the females that prefer the trait and have the, so they have preference for the trait, and then they're going to have offspring that have the trait, and the males that have the, prefer the trait, and sorry, the females that prefer not the trait, and the offspring will have not the trait, are going to kind of match out with the population as a whole. So this is, you can actually draw this equilibrium line where mean display, the average display, and the average preference are going to actually fall on that line. And that's the idea for an equilibrium when it comes to female selection. However, we're going to have to throw natural selection with that. Oh, so first thing, choice versus display. I'm going to put this a little earlier. And then uh, natural selection. We throw natural selection in this. And it's going to, it's going to have a certain um, optimal display for survival. So with the widow birds, having an augmented tail, where the researchers had snipped off part of the tail and made it much longer, decreased the odds of survival. Having too short of a tail, that's actually fine. Too short of a tail, just fine, not a problem. Okay, so there's a maximum amount for survival, and there's an optimal amount for both survival and mating. So we see the optimal display for mating success is a little higher, and the optimal display for survival is just a straight line. And uh, some of them are above the optimum display for survival, but they are closer to the optimal display for Mating success, an equilibrium is going to occur when the mean display is between optimal for mating and optimal for survival. If it's on both of those lines, if that point where optimal display for mating and optimal display for survival and the mean display is right there, perfection. And you don't actually see a, a trade-off at that point. But we're going to see reasons why you actually want to have a trade-off. But what about more extreme environments, like the tundra, or um, let's see, more extreme environments, volcanic, uh, volcanic areas where you don't have enough food, or the desert. So, like, what do mating displays look like when you have a more difficult environment? Well, think back to those iguanas. The biggest iguana was obviously the one that would get the most mates, but the biggest iguana in a, on an island that had a more difficult survival was smaller than the biggest iguana, or even the iguana mean, on an island where the iguanas survive more often. So natural selection does still have a toll on this, but we can get something called runaway sexual selection. Runaway selection is if genetic drift displaces a population such that the mean display is now farther away from the equilibrium line. The mean display will actually evolve back toward equilibrium over time. But what about if the preference starts carrying it away? So the display starts moving back towards equilibrium, but if the preference moves it away from equilibrium, you can actually see the females preferring males that are not um, optimized for survival or that are not along this equilibrium line. So the females, the, the females there are going to um, prefer males with more extreme traits than the environment would actually prefer. Your book goes into this in quite a bit more detail, and I do urge you to refresh yourself on this because runaway selection is just one of those things that can happen when, it, when a population gets too small for a moment, and the genetics on that equilibrium line are skewed, and then the display starts to evolve away from, um, away from an optimality. So why do females choose what they do? We often say that females choose, that evolution overall is going to only use what exists already in the gene pool to allow for any new traits. So it's impossible for a mammal, for example, to develop wings plus hands plus feet because the alleles for having six limbs don't exist in the mammalian population. 
so you can only use what already exists. One thing that is actually going to allow females to choose what they do is simple natural selection. Females will prefer traits that increase the survival of their offspring. Females will look for a male that is surviving well in the, uh, in the environment. And this is often one of those like undercurrents here. Females don't prefer males that are sick. Females don't prefer males that are missing limbs. Females don't prefer males that are asymmetrical in their facial expression. These are things that females do not prefer because they are all hints of a lower, um, a lower survival ability. Then you have a sensory bias. Females can only choose what they can sense. And males will evolve to take advantage of the sensory bias. So here we have a water mite. And what it does is it's going to gently approach a female climbing on blades of grass and then wiggle its arms in such a way that mimics a copepod, which is the prey of the water mite. The female will then start lunging towards the male, and the, as the female lunges towards the male, he initiates a mating display. So he's using the female's predatory instincts to initiate a mating display. Now, you can see in some organisms like black widow spiders, this ends quite badly. But in, in this example, He's using what the female already has to notice me. And when they also found out that hungry females are more likely to mate. Hungry females are more likely to mate because they're more likely to notice me. So that's a sensory bias. We also see birds tend to go for red displays. So birds can see best in the red wavelengths. So birds prefer red things. Uh, insects often have a bias towards pheromones because insects have a good antennae that can pick up pheromones very well. Uh, same for mammals. Most mammals have very have very delicate uh, smell receptors, and they're able to smell things very well. Uh, mating displays that involve hearing. You can think of organisms that can hear very well. They prefer, uh, they're often going to have mating displays that are going to be sounds and such like that. So these sensory biases are going to be part of the determination of what is actually going to be a female choice. Um, for example, bats aren't going to choose a red display. Because it's at night. It doesn't make sense. All right. Resource acquisition. Females also uh, prefer males that can bring them resources. Uh, the scorpion fly is an example here. The scorpion fly is going to prefer males that have a, uh, a law a, that provide a bigger feast. So scorpion flies will capture a prey item and will share it with the female, and the female will copulate with them for a certain amount of time depending on what prey item is bought. The only exception here is when the male brings a lady beetle, because lady beetles have a stench to them. And uh, in that case, the female is like, oh, yes, let's never mind, never mind. <laughs> so the bigger the food, the longer the female will copulate. And the longer the female copulates, the more sperm is transferred by the male. So the male actually gets a successful, uh, successful thing here, and capping out really at about 27 minutes of copulation. That's enough. So you see also most of the females don't copulate for more than 27 minutes anyway. Then we have the sexy sons hypothesis. So if the male has a trait that the female finds attractive, it can be implied that other females will also find this trait attractive. Let's check out the runaway sexual selection thing again. So the female is implying that, other, that others are, have the genetics like her to prefer, um, to prefer a trait that the males, that the, uh, the male has a trait, the female finds it attractive, other females are going to find it attractive, so if I have offspring with this trait, then the females are going to find that attractive. Okay, so that's another reason for liking Justin Bieber. So if females find Justin Bieber attractive, then other females that mate with Justin Bieber are going to have offspring that look like Justin Bieber and sing like Justin Bieber, and therefore they're going to have uh, more offspring with more females. It's the sexy son's hypothesis, is higher male fitness in reproduction. Then we have something called the handicap hypothesis. And the handicap hypothesis is that, uh, so choosy females are going to get the better genes. Um, oh yeah, sorry, choosy females are also going to get better genes. This is with the, uh, the frog hypothesis. So, here we have frogs that uh, the females chose long calling males or short calling males. And the females that chose the long calling males are going to have um, offspring that are going to do better. This was tested by taking the offspring of females that mated with long calling males and putting them either on a high food diet or a low food diet. And taking the offspring of females that chose short calling males and putting them either on a high food diet or a low food diet. What was seen is that the offspring of long calling males were, had um, faster larval growth in 1996 
um, in the high food diet and um, on 1995 and 1996 on the low food diet. The time as tadpole was shorter on the high food diet. Um, for long calling males, it's good to have a short time as a tadpole. The mass of the froglet was higher on the low food diet in 1995. The larval survival was higher on the high food diet in 1995. And the froglet growth was higher for long calling male offspring in 1996. So really what happened here is if there's going to be any change, the, there are better genes present in that long calling male. So the long calling male shows that he's basically got some sort of thing going on. He's got it going on in such a way that he has better genes overall, faster froglet and tadpole growth. That's good. So in that case, what's happening here is that long call is a direct indication of better genes. There's also the handicap hypothesis, which is that a sexually selected trait may actually cost the male enough that it would be impossible to have both weak genes and this trait. So one of my favorite examples is the cardinal. Cardinals are red all over, not like a, not like a newspaper or Twitter feed. They're actually red. You know, the whole body is red. And that is going to leave them, that's going to make them very easy prey for any organisms that see well in the red uh, wavelength, which is any predatory birds. So any predatory birds are going to see cardinals very easily. Cardinals also tend to exist in forests in areas where the leaves are gone during the winter, giving them very little cover. So if a cardinal can survive where, while wearing all red during these harsh times, then it must be very good at, uh, at getting away from predators with such a handicap. It's kind of like during the zombie apocalypse, the guy that's carrying a 45 pound rucksack is obviously very good at defending himself against zombies considering he's you know, much slower than everyone else. And he's obviously the person you want on your zombie apocalypse team. So, hashtag 2021, too soon? <laughs> anyway, um, the handicap hypothesis really is that females want to see things, see the, see things in the males that would, would give them lower fitness, but the males can survive nonetheless, even with such a handicap. So here are some reasons that females prefer what they, what they do, be it for the bias towards certain things, towards actually understanding enough that this is going to make males weaker, so if he can have this and still survive, he must have really good other genes. It also means the cardinal has to be able to provide enough food to keep that red coat, and that's hard too. So, a lot going on. Whenever you see a cardinal, remember, they got a lot going on to keep that good, beautiful red coat. Females are also capable of increasing fitness if they just have more mates. So this is kind of in the opposite of what I've been going on earlier with the, um, the Bateman gradients. So, Litters may have multiple fathers. Okay, what's an adaptation to that? Well, it increases litter diversity because you have your Belding's ground squirrel here. Uh, the number of male mother's uh, sexual partners goes up, so the female here has uh, either one, two, three, four, five um, offspring uh, <laughs> fathers. The litter size gets bigger, and one reason for this is the, the female might actually release additional eggs given that she has been mating more. So if a female mates more often, she may release additional eggs and have a larger litter with a greater genetic diversity. Increasing genetic diversity, there you go. That can be a good thing for, for, uh, for the animal in a changing environment. Uh, for cats, too. For cats, the more males they have, the more diverse their litter is. It's actually an interesting fact. Humans can actually do the same thing. Humans can, a human female can't have twins with, the same, with different males. It's possible. Very rare. <laughs> so if increasing the number of mates is actually going to increase female fitness, it makes sense that sexual selection for more mates should follow in these examples. We also see that males can be choosier. choosy. Male pride fish, as we mentioned earlier, they're going to be taking a lot of the care of the offspring. They prefer females that are larger. They will actually spend more time with females that are larger, hoping to get to mate with females that are going to be larger, because that obviously shows that the female is able to take better care of herself. So and she also, they also prefer females without parasites. As I said, natural selection is part of this. In this case, sexual selection is on the female. So it can really go both ways. And um, yeah, we can see sexual selection extremes in some cases where the male does all the parental care. He's going to be very extreme about choosing exactly which female. And that's going to be in these polyandrous uh, species. In polyandrous species, we expect to see um, sexual selection favoring outlandish traits in the female, and we may even see runaway sexual selection giving rise to very odd traits in females, too. 
that sex isn't always about just having offspring. So here's an example where bono, this is the bonobo, pan paniscus, genetically our closest relative, just a little closer than chimpanzees. They're monogamous-ish. They're not permanently monogamous. However, um, we've seen them use sex as a form of a form of breeding, where they greet one another and mate. Uh, it's a form of conflict resolution. It's said that chimpanzees, which is pan um, pan troglodytes, uh, so they chimpanzees will create fights over sex, whereas um, pan paniscus will have sex about fights. So there's a fight going on. Let's resolve this the good old fashioned way, you know. And um, they will have, it, of course, for use for reproduction. Uh, pan troglodytes, the chimpanzee, is much more violent of a creature. Uh, so it will often form these tribes and steal women from other tribes, and it's just it's a violent animal. Pan paniscus, as has been seen, is not a violent animal at all. It's also the pan troglodytes is a it's a patriarchally led uh, species, whereas pan paniscus is a matriarchally led species. Uh, pairings between these organisms can be male by male to female. Okay, female to female, including multiple different ways of coupling that are not something people would see in other species in nature, and male to male couplings as well, including well, yes, any kind of sex you can imagine, really. A uh, problem with this is observations are here in captivity. So captivity can be a bit of an artifact. A lot of a lot of weird behaviors come out when you lock a couple creatures in a cage for a long period of time. Uh, just watch the Big Brother series. I'm sure you see where a bunch of odd behaviors occur when you lock a bunch of people in a room for too long. So that's also not really implying sexual selection. It can just be about activity as well. So there's a difference there between activity and selection. A lot of organisms uh, will reproduce, will have sex without reproduction merely as a way of ensuring social bonds as well. So that is also a part of it. It's not always about natural selection, and it's not always about offspring. So check your objectives. Why would tail extensions be all the newest fad among male widowbirds? What does a female gain from mating with a male with a longer widowbird tail? And what would be needed to make this go into a runaway sexual selection instance? Again, check your book with this. It comes with a few little caveats. I'm not entirely sure I got everything, every little detail covered in the short period I do on this lecture, but make sure, make double sure with your book. Also, what is an advantage of polyandry, where a female has multiple males? Check these objectives, and uh, have a nice day.